Hello, everyone, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we're welcoming back for yet another uh, stimulating conversation, Bill Bupert, who is a writer and author at zerogov.com. Uh, he's, uh, he's the author of a book, uh, Zero Gov, Limited Government, Unicorns, and Other Mythological Creatures. Um, you can buy that through the book or, I assume, Amazon, right? Um, it's Amazon for $2.99. See that? It won't break your wallet even. <laughs> it's an excellent read. Um, Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> and, uh, and he's also a co-host on the Freedom Fiends uh, show uh, where he, he's on twice a month. Uh, so today, he, uh, you know, and, and he runs a blog where he writes various articles. Uh, and one recent one, which I, really caught my eye, is called The Torture State. American Inquisition. Uh, so I really want to get his take on that uh, because uh, torture. I guess the last time they really brought up torture was, uh, um, I guess, was Guantanamo Bay, right? And then, and then, uh, and then I guess a little bit when in, in Chicago, right? That um, that place was discovered to have tortured the right the people. I forget what that was called. Um, exactly the black exactly the black building or something. Like I know that. exactly the one you're talking about. It's a black site. Right, yeah. right, right. So, um, so yeah, so we'll yeah. get into that. Um, and perhaps uh, we were discussing before we started recording about Donald Trump, so I think that's a lot of people's minds. Sure. <laughs> the yeah. uh, absurdity of the man. So, uh, so uh, Bill, welcome back to the show. Well, it's an honor to come on your show, and I really appreciate what you're doing for the, uh, for the liberty and the abolitionist movement. Yeah, yeah, really. Uh, I'm really having a lot of fun doing it, although I'm not getting paid. You know, it's like, like, like I think with you, it's a labor of love, right? We would love to make a living at it, but what, what can it's you do? <laughs> <laughs> we, we would say, you know, you, know I, I, you were asking me earlier on the program before we, before we came on uh, how often I write, and I try to write twice a week by discipline, and I have guest editors on occasion when I can't make it twice a week, and sometimes I do once a week, and I try to come up with original content that's interesting. Writing makes me smarter. And I find that when I come on podcasts with intelligent, articulate fellows like you and, and others out there, that yeah, I always learn something when I do this. It gets me more exposure. And as Michael Dean would tell us, it's rather fiendish to do this together because we just get better and better at audio liberty. Yeah, yeah, it's a capitalism, right? It's a it's a win win situation. Yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful about it. That's right. Cross cross promotion, right? And, and I, that's right. And I've got to use my my tagline from Freedom Fiends, if you don't mind, if you'll indulge me, which is that. You and I are in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the work of philosophically terraforming the planet one disobedient surf at a time. Beautiful. I love that. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Um, Indeed. Steal it. Definitely. <laughs> I will. Um, so, so, yeah, so let's get into your, your article about, uh, about torture. So, so can you give us a little background sure. the, uh, of what it's about, summary? I can indeed. Uh, torture has always been around. And, of course, I don't have to explain to the audience what torture is. Torture is, is uh, in, in, in a very short form, it's the non-consensual sadistic abuse of another human beings, another human being to derive some kind of gain or information from doing that. Now, I would suggest to you that torture has been institutionalized in the United States since the Constitution, if not the Articles of the Confederation, if not, back to 1775, a year before the DI. The reason I say that is this. April 19th, 1775, Lexington and Concord, there was an incident that really put the back into the Redcoats resistance on their way back from having limped away from Lexington and Concord, and they came under fire, and the troops had to actually turn around and head back to Boston. In the process of heading back to Boston, a number of them were shot, killed, wounded, whatever the case may be. The Redcoats, the Lobsterbacks, the British regulars, they weren't, you know, because everybody was British at the time, to include Paul Revere, because mm -hmm. he didn't say the British are coming, he said the regulars are out. One of the regulars apparently had been mutilated by a member of the militia, not under orders to do so, but had been murdered by a member of the militia. This really put the steel into the spine of the retreating regulars, and it may have been a correlative factor in them busting into houses and wounding and killing men, women, and children on their way back to Boston. I use that illustration for two purposes. Number one, to illustrate that number one, it, well, number one, it's happened a lot in our history, and it's been there for a long time. But number two, when people are treated in that fashion and mutilated in that fashion, 
all it does is make things worse for both parties involved. And we're going to talk about that a little bit down the line because what I address in my article is what I think torture did to the French when they used that in Algeria from 1948 to 1958 and 62. Yeah, I, so Americans have been torturing for a while. I I, uh, I I did hear about that story. Um, I, I recently we um, we we had um, Prof. C. J. I don't know if you're familiar with him uh, from the Dangerous History Podcast. So, right? Yeah, he's a re- awesome historian. Um, and we had him on the Seeds of Liberty yeah. Podcast show, uh, and really great guy. And uh, yeah, and he did his rev- uh, Revolutionary War series, and I was listening to a bit of that. And yeah, wow, <laughs> it's like you know, there's a reason that that kind of stuff was not. Um, included in your government history education um but um but yeah yeah you know it really brings it to light and it, it's like watching it on tv or in real life is like he really brought it to life the way he described it so yeah oh he's he he's a he's a great historian and a great storyteller because great history is great storytelling it's those narrative arcs and those thematic arcs and those arcs of well great men and minor men and great women and minor women who make things interesting you know would anybody watch a soap opera if there was not infidelity or deceit? Of course not. <laughs> How would it be interesting, right? Right. <laughs> oh <laughs> of course my <laughs> Right. You know, and, and history history is chock full of that. So we fast forward from April 19, 1775, and we go to 1898, and we have the Spanish-American Wars, where we're fighting for possession of all the Spanish colonies in the Philippines, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, places like that. In the Philippines, we find that the American forces endorse waterboarding and use waterboarding. And by the way, they estimate one out of every three native Filipinos who were waterboarded died in the process. This is the same time when there was a general order on one of the islands that was under occupation by the Americans that any military age male over the age of 10, I repeat, over the age of 10, could be shot on sight if they wished. Hmm. We fast forward to World War I, to World War II, and then into the Korean War, into the Vietnam War, in which I recommend a book called uh, Kill Anything That Moves, part of the American Empire Project. You'll find it on Amazon, in which they relate that between 2.5 million and 3.5 million civilians, not soldiers, civilians died during that conflict in that little sliver of time from 62 to 75 that America was involved in that conflict. Then we fast forward now, 2001, all of a sudden what we have is for the first time in our history we have the office of legislative council under john Yu, with bushevik too saying yea and verily not only are we going to allow torture what they like to call enhanced interrogation techniques we're going to endorse guantanamo we're going to endorse black sites and we're going to do something that's called rendition rendition is where you take a guy like bill or like danilo who becomes an enemy of the state and maybe they're a little deeper into it or you suspect they have more information than than they would let on you send them to a black site outside of the continental united states outside of cuba let's say saudi arabia romania hungary places like that and they do very naughty nasty sadistic things to people so so here and i think that when you when you institutionalize torture and i'm paraphrasing here a society and a civilization is credited with its degree of civilization by the way it treats the most vulnerable and innocent members of society. In this case, I I happen to be a pro-lifer from conception. I happen to be anti-death penalty, and I'm very much anti-torture of any type, because not only does it degrade the human being that you're torturing through sleep deprivation, electrical shock, stress positions, or whatever kind of maniacal, sadistic stuff they come up with to torture another human being, maybe even flaying them alive, like we see in, in Game of Thrones. It debases the torturer and the torturee. And whatever empires practice abroad, it all comes home. And that's what's happening now, because you mentioned it when we were talking about the show earlier, when you, you mentioned that Chicago black site mm. with the Chicago PD, where they were doing that kind of thing to people. It, to, the reason torture concerns me so much is because not only have they institutionalized that, and then of course we have the infanticide, then of course we have the death penalty, and then of course we have the gulag system in America. You know, we have the largest per capita prison population on planet Earth. 
people on parole, probation, and, uh, and in cages from the local to the federal level. It numbers, I think, three to four million. We can stipulate that by looking it up on the internet. Mm-hmm. But look at this, for instance. Today, on the count of The Guardian, believe it or not, in the UK, is maintaining a database on how many people are killed by police in the United States. The count today is 626. Now, those that they don't kill and those who they have maimed, well, those who have, that they have maimed, they'll end up in custody. And they're going to be concierged into the local to the federal level of the cage. What I don't have numbers on, which is probably impossible for me to get numbers on, is how many inmates are tortured, maimed, and killed in the gulag system that's run by the government exclusively? Right. I don't know. Right. You know, the 626 <laughs> number is shocking to me. And, of course, do you think the federal government maintains a database? No, a British newspaper has to maintain the numbers for America because I guess maybe the federal government doesn't have enough money you know, to run a database like that or, you know, put my Sark switch on. When I say that. <laughs> you know, right, 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 right. And, and, and I think, Danilo, the reason why they don't want that number revealed is because it's such a gross slap in the face to every civilized human being to know that many people are being killed on a daily basis by cops, which looks like five. Now, take a guess if you would, Danilo, and I know this is sort of off topic, but this really does speak to the topic of torture in the police state, because that's what we're talking about, because they're married to each other, especially when the empire does what, does abroad and brings that home. Hmm. Take a guess at how many cops have died this year as a result of gunshot, and I'll even include accidental gunshots up to this point. How many cops have died per year? Yeah, and, yeah, up up to this point from January first. Oh, well, I I, yeah. I I wouldn't know, but just, but, a, just a wild, just a wild guess, just a wild, just a wild ass guess. I mean, a few hundred, one hundred, two hundred, sixteen, <laughs> sixteen. Seriously, <laughs> sixteen, sixteen. <laughs> Look at that. You know that reminds me. That reminds me of a so, uh, a statistic. Like I think it was Adam Kokesh. He 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 went out to the public and he was asking them. You know, you, you'll get a prize if you can tell me what are the most dangerous jobs in America. <laughs> and everybody pretty much immediately first thing being a, a, a you know U.S. soldier, being a police officer, being a firefighter, <laughs> right? Yeah. All, all government jobs, yeah. and none yeah. of them made the not. top ten list. <laughs> First, what, what are the, the and if I may, I'll I'll, I'll include these uh, the links to both ODMP, which is the Officer Down Memorial page that that lists those numbers, okay, and the one to the Guardian counted. If you could post those for the show, sure, if you don't sure, mind, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that'd be great, and people can resource that. But so think of that, and I'll call it eighteen because two of them were accidental shootings, and I don't know whether that's a cop shooting each other or not. For instance, Brian Terry, the Border Patrol officer who died several years ago, you heard about that on the Mexican border. He was shot by the Border Patrol. Really? But they made it out as if a rip team from, from, from the Mexican cartels had shot him. But that's not the case. It was fratricide. Yeah. So I don't, I don't even know. I'd have to dig in the numbers to see how many of those, those, um, those, those policemen who were killed were actually killed in an altercation that involved a gun that wasn't fratricide. I don't know. Because when they have the two additional ones that say accidental gunshot, mm-hmm. I'm taking a guess and and, um, and raising my eyebrow and thinking, oh, his buddy probably shot him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, that's right. probably what happened. Now, this is 57 dead total up to this point this year. But that 57 is 16 gunshots plus two accidental because the rest is heart attacks, illness, 911, car accidents, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Where they call it right. line of duty deaths right. so that they can get more money out of the taxpayers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not actually crime deaths. So when you do the number of 16 versus 626, and you do those ratios, wow. And I'm of a mind, too, that 626 number, Danilo, is under miss and non-reported. Mm-hmm. I think it's bigger than that. But right now, we're trending towards 1,300 to 1,400. And I'm certain that either you or your audience remember seeing memes where they said, you know what? 400 people are killed by police every year. Do you remember hearing that number? Yeah. It's not. It's three to four times that amount. And it has been a lot. This is none of this is new either, because hmm. all this is being captured because of videotape. This has been going on for decades. You, you know, you know. So they, what does that have to do with torture? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so what does that? I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's okay. No, no, no problem. Sorry. No problem. What does that have to do with torture? What it has to do with torture is that. What are tasers for? 
How many beatings do we see on video? How many beatings do we see of people in the gulag? Yeah. How many women have we seen assaulted by cops? Pregnant women tased, a woman shoved across a drunk tank inside a police facility. She hits her face on the concrete bench and has to get plastic surgery as a result. Yeah. I would suggest to you that all of that is torture. All of that is torture because it's sadistic and, and it's, it's the imposition of pain on other people at the whim of a government figure. That's what it all comes down to. And I, I pretty much say that may be definitional outside of private serial killer circles. So yeah. You were going to say no private serial killers cannot can't, can't even compete. <laughs> no way. I, I think um, there, there's there's a statistic I saw that um, well, again Adam Kokesh frequently goes out and he, and he tests people. You know, who are you more likely to get killed by? And and it's and, and the answer is you know comparing with police or the, or, or a terrorist you're, you're like well 52 times more likely to get killed by a police officer than by a terrorist right and yet everyone's uh, trembling with fear of the some Muslims over there you know an ocean away <laughs> you know that don't have a, don't have a navy don't, don't don't have an air force don't have you know yeah yeah and it just goes to show you the, uh, the I mean I the power of propaganda you know it shows you the power of the government education media complex. You know, for, for, from preschool through postgraduate studies, it is owned lock, stock, and barrel by the American government. Grove City College and Hillsdale College are the only two colleges in America, the only two out of the thousands, because they accept no federal grant whatsoever that receive no federal aid. Because all the college has to do for that 35-kilometer baggage train of regulations and rules to come in behind it is one student accepts a federal grant. Then the entire school becomes occupied by the feds. Oh, really? Wow. Oh really? Only yeah. those? I didn't, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, talking about colleges, I. I uh, <laughs> that's a conversation I have with a lot of people about you know the value of a college education today, and uh, you know as how it I has declined. It. Yeah. How it has declined so much. Not yeah. only because of the price going up, but just because of the internet, the advent of the internet, and transmi- rapid transmission of ideas and. And it's just it's just an outdated dinosaur institution like any other government controlled entity, you know, it just freezes in time. That's right. And like molasses, it you know it does. doesn't conform or doesn't doesn't uh, update with you know with the technology of the present. So. Brick, brick and mortar can't be as resilient and quick to fix as online yeah. colleges can be. I think online colleges of course are the way of the future. Yeah. Harvard's a hedge fund. And, and the amount of money that is spent on, on college tuition is absurd. But I have no sympathy whatsoever for people with tremendous college debt. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, I, I see people holding signs up in, in the media saying, Forgive student loans. I got a, I got a degree in uh, yeah. Navajo lesbian feminist studies <laughs> for uh, you know, Nav- Navajo lesbian feminist with a cleft palate or whatever the case may be. And I happen to be that. And I'm $180,000 in debt. Here's oh. my challenge to them. Show me one, just one student who was forced to sign the contract for their student loans. Just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, um, yeah. Because I, what's next? Cars and how? Yeah. So I see, I see people, you know, clamoring to the federal government, right? Forgive student loans, um, or or even even worse, you know, make colleges free. Like, look at these countries. Look at Europe, right? Look at all the, you know, South America, free. Uh, higher education <laughs> why can't we do that <laughs> and i'm like you know do you seriously think it's free like it's, you know people seriously some people think that i mean other people understand right yeah you got to pay more taxes and then it's free but then it's not really free because you have less money you know so just and 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 then and then you have the boondoggle of of when the state acquires those funds you know how much of those funds actually go to the to the place the destination <laughs> And instead right. of actually, you know, yeah. paying yeah. off, you know, special interest groups and, and, and political friends along the way. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so in the end, it's enormous waste. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's enormous waste. You know, what's interesting, though, is that when, when we examine what's happening with colleges, we realize that a lot of it is really schlocky, junky, infomercial junk that has nothing to do with advancing human liberty. It has everything to do with making sure that people are happy with their chains and happy in their cages. Because a, a bird that's lived in a cage all of its life doesn't really know what its wings are for mm-hmm. because it's never been able to practice that. I'll give you a for instance, and we're way off topic here, but there it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. 
<laughs> so for instance is, I'm an Austrian economist. I'm certain that you have dabbled in Austrian economics. Yeah, right? I've studied a good amount. Most of your audience probably has. Yeah, so yeah. Well, Mises and Hayek and Rothbard, mm -hmm. I think we've all been influenced heavily yeah. and taken the direction that we did philosophically by what they do. What is absent in Austrian economics, which you find in Marx in economics, monetarist, Keystone Keynesian, and all the rest? Mathematics. Why is mathematics absent? Because mathematically, you cannot use cardinal rules to predict how people are going to behave with money and finite time and resources. It's madness to think that I can use an algebraic or calculus, calculaic formula to say what your utility is for the chocolate ice cream, as, as Danilo <laughs> versus my utility for chocolate ice cream, as Bill. You're really going to figure that out with a mathematical formula? No, you're not, because all you're doing is impressing other people who use these formulas to delude themselves to think that they're describing reality when they're not. I'm fond of saying that macroeconomics, as opposed to microeconomics, which is, which is the study of the firm, macroeconomics is simply a sophisticated academic rationalization for the interference of the government with the economy. That's all it is. It serves no other purpose. You know, monetarist with, with Milton Friedman, I like to call him Milton Fraudman, but his son David gets mad at me when I say that. But uh, Milton Friedman, you know, mon monetarist economics, it's, it's just a tad to the right of the, Keynesian, of the uh, Keystone Keynesians. There's really no difference because well, what he was saying, he was saying, well, we'll take a little bit of the animal spirits out of the Keystone Keynesians and we'll put a little more mathematical rigor in the monopolization of the fiat currency that we administer to the entire country through political gambits. Great, great. You've made no difference whatsoever and all you've done is secured my chains. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. Yeah, you know what's yeah. funny? I, in my in my family, um, I have one family member who did study uh, uh, economics in, in university, and uh, and I got into a pretty heavy, yeah. pretty uh, uh, you know emotionally heated conversation with her when it came to the Federal Reserve and things like that. <laughs> she just didn't want to hear it. And and what was funny was you know when I was talking about the Federal Reserve and currency creation and and things like that. And then she's like, "Oh, you're you're probably uh, into Milton Friedman and that you know the Chicago school, like 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 the Austrian school did not even register on their on their spectrum, oh, of course. you know. And it's amazing how it's like yeah. you don't you barely even learn about that, uh, you know. It's like the, it's like they, they really think the Chicago school is the most extreme, <laughs> you know. Is that's it? <laughs> Little do they know, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, and um, and it's amazing that you know." I have learned a lot from independent, you know, books and podcasts and, and uh, um, articles and things like that. And, I, you know, I still have a lot to learn. But, but yeah, I learned a good amount. And, uh, and, 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 I mean, come to think of it, like, like how much money would I have wasted studying economics in a university? <laughs> you know, as, as, as a when, you, when you've got the Ludwig von Mises Institute to provide you with everything. Yeah, yeah, and, and everything I mean, is free. They, must, they must have thousands of hours. It is thousands yeah. of hours of yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, everything's free. So, so uh, yeah, so the internet's real great. Um, it's a blessing on humanity, and I think not 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 many people realize that, right? And uh, <laughs> as John Kerry said, the the internet is making it harder to govern, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, with, we're, we're talking about e economists. You find the same thing with political scientists. I like, to, I like to be really clear in language. I think it's important. So this word politicians is, is rather neutered and mundane mm -hmm. and doesn't really possess the, the chutzpah to describe what it really is. Politicians are violence brokers, bottom line. When you strip all the, you know, the bunting away and the bad music and, the, and all their promises, that's all it's about is who's going to wield the bat, how often the bat will come down on your head in a wood shampoo, and what you're going to do to deserve that. That's what they're talking about. My challenge to every political science professor in the university is, okay, for the next hour, I don't want you to suggest anything about the initiation of force. Go. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to remain silent, right? <laughs> cricket, cricket, cricket. Or, or, or he's not going to realize that laws are the initiation of force or you know is a law is a gun right uh some people um, yeah i guess and the rule of law is a myth yeah yeah <laughs> um i wrote an article about that about a month ago where i talked about john hoskins's article on the rule of law being a myth mm -hmm. 
And rule of law is something you find from left to right. All, everybody says, well, well, we wouldn't be civilized if we didn't have the rule of law. Rule of law, rule of law just like limited government, is an impossible proposition. It can't happen because of interpretive frameworks and the fact that every human being on Earth, now brace yourselves, and I hope your audience is sitting down. Doesn't exist anywhere in the human dimension. The softer the science, the more apparent it becomes that bias, bias filters, filters and conf confirmation biases are the rule in how we examine the world and look at the world. Do I try to stop myself when I'm listening to Rothbard or Mises or Di Lorenzo or some of the other champions of liberty out there from saying, whatever they tell me, I want to make sure I demand the same evidentiary bar from them that I would from the lefty, commie, collectivist hustards that are out there that are constantly trying to get me to, to take the wood shampoo. Yeah. You know, and I have to fight that because it's my bias because my assumption is Mises and Rothbard, who I've taken very serious in my own intellectual and philosophical formation, I have a confirmation bias with them and I have to be very conscious about making sure that I exact from them the same level of scrutiny and skepticism that I apply to the left and the right, even though I hate that term, left and right, because I think you're either an individualist, like the middle or myself, or you're a bloody coercionist. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. Right, right. <clears throat> two, two different ways to, uh, yeah. to you know, to kill, beheading or, uh, you know, bloodletting. I mean, still death. <laughs> it's, it doesn't really matter the, <laughs> you know, it's, the I, method, I, right? I'm, that's that's right. I, I'm fond of saying that voting is just a serial killer beauty contest. Yeah, yeah. Voting is violence. That's what it comes down to. So let me let, let me ask you about the the rule of law because I I yeah. uh, when I when I yeah. when I post yeah. stuff on Facebook, there's this one guy who is a really, um, he's really uh, how do you say a very passionate uh, minarchist, and one of the things that he constantly yeah. brings up, which I think a lot of people are, have on their mind, yeah. you know, you say, you know, you're against government, you're against laws. So what's to stop somebody from like starting a child pornography thing, or you know. I don't know, human trafficking or, <laughs> you know, a lot of these ridiculous yeah. things. And I mean, the first thing that I would say is, does that happen today? <laughs> right. And of course it, it does. And, and see, but you know what, that's, but that's the answer. I, I think you've answered his query because, because what he wants to do is he wants to say, Hey, this $4 trillion government that we have over our heads right now probably costs more than that. This $4 trillion government, we need that to stop child pornography. We need that to stop illegals from crossing the border. We need that to make sure those traffic lights function. No, you don't. You don't. I, I find it foolish where I'm constantly challenged, where I'll hear people say, hey, if you don't like it here, you should move. So what you're telling me is that because I want more freedom and liberty, I should leave. That's making a great case for you now, isn't it? How does that work? Yeah. Here's why rule of law doesn't work. Let's take four words out of the Constitution. And if any of your audience members read my stuff, you know that I think the Constitution is probably one of the most diabolical instruments to advance collectivist government the earth has ever seen. Mm -hmm. So that my best of a thorough whisper. But what's happened is there's four words in that Constitution. General, general welfare and commerce clause, right? Mm -hmm. Just four words. From those four words, do you suspect there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of words in the Federal Register alone, let alone all the satrap registers from the local to the state level, that describe what those words have been twisted to mean as an enforcement mechanism for the government to use against the population? Right. General welfare. How, of course how it vague is. is that, right? Grover, Cle <laughs> yeah. Grover, Grover Cleveland, in, in, I think it was 1876, comes up with the Interstate Commerce Commission. Where does he get the authority to do that? The Constitution says Commerce Clause. Roll forward to 1943, Wickard versus Philborn. I think it was Wickard, he's a wheat farmer. He grows wheat, he consumes that wheat on his farm, and he doesn't sell that wheat. Wickard versus Philborn says, even though you consume that wheat, even though you didn't sell that wheat, by not selling that wheat, you affected commerce. <laughs> well, look at the implications there. I mean, the, and the federal government loved that decision. And then we fast forward to today, where we have Obamacare. Not Robert's 
last oration on that, but the first one he did. If you look at Clarence Thomas's dissent, Clarence Thomas says something very interesting. I think it's on page 102 of his dissent, where it reads, and I paraphrase, what's so dangerous about Obamacare is not only is it a tax, but it is taxing not activity, but inactivity. So we take the Commerce Clause from 1791, we fast forward to Cleveland, we fast forward to 1943, and we fast forward to today, two words, two words, alleged rule of law have turned into what? A monstrous straitjacket on our ability to be free men and women. Monstrous. And we haven't even talked about the general welfare. And let's suppose we have this to know. There's a court case coming in, and somebody can pick out of a hat what the court case involves. It could be medical marijuana, it could be a death, it could be a robbery, whatever you call it. You're from Harvard, and I happen to be from, let's make up something, the, the San Diego Jeffersonian School of Law, a rather conservative institution. You're from a liberal institution. You're a liberal lawyer. I'm a conservative lawyer. I guarantee you, even though we both work towards minarchist and maxarchist ends, we may have different interpretations on it, and the judge will take a decision on what he wants that to be, but we both have different interpretations of what precedents are in the law to establish this rule of law. That rule of law is politically malleable. If it's politically malleable, it means it has no objective standard whatsoever. And we just said a few minutes ago that objectivity is impossible in the human condition. So when I combine those things, I say that the rule of law, and John Hosness in his article, and you can find it on my website, uh, The Myth of the Rule of Law, he makes a much more cogent and eloquent case that's backed up by a whole lot of facts and, and anecdotal evidence and stuff that, that this brief span of time, which I'm explaining it here, it could be amplified there, but he makes the case, it's just all it does is work to making government bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, talking about Obamacare, it's it's funny that how how proud Obama is for how many people have registered. Where, whereas you know, you have to realize, well, if you put a gun to people's heads, you know, you will get a lot of people to do stuff. <laughs> That's not something to be proud of, you know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and by the way, going back to the beginning of the show, torture is rule of law in America. Right. Right. It is the rule of law. It's institutionalized. It's permitted, and and all of us know just how awful it's been for a lot of the witnesses that are coming out. I think there was one 12-year-old boy who was taken into Gitmo, and he was subject to a lot of really nasty stuff. What's happened in Iraq, Afghanistan, all the black sites. One can find anecdotal evidence and stories of people who have been released or made their way out of it. The stories that we're not going to hear is people who have died within the system. People who have been maimed in such a fashion, cowed in such a fashion, that they're, they're so victimized and traumatized by what they experience they, they don't have the courage to share it with anybody else but i did want before we leave the whole torture thing i would urge your audience to examine what happened when the french went into algeria and they used torture as an institutional and martial device that was part of their war aims when they were there and they did this on a regular basis not only did they come come out of their worst for it and they didn't win the campaign because usually torture and mutilation tends to stiff tends to stiffen the resistance campaign that's being tortured and mutilated and doesn't make them cow in fear. It makes them horribly angry, especially if it happens to women and children. It had a whole lot of repercussions in France and gave France a real black eye internationally. And then ironically enough, this is correlative, not positive, I think it was sixty three or sixty four French Paris and certain French regulars tried to stage a military coup against the fourth regime in France to actually take over the Parisian government and a lot of it could be traced to the elements that had committed to torture, committed torture and used it as a national device in Algeria trying to keep Algeria and two other countries, Tunisia and one other one within the French sphere. But of course they lost it because in 58, Algeria sort of went dark from a counterinsurgency perspective. The French backed off, left, 62 all of a sudden. The French are prostrate. They can't do anything about it. They grant Algeria its independence. It has its independence. What's really interesting about the, uh, the colonization of Algeria is that you can count probably in the thousands, not the tens of thousands, but the thousands of French Pétanois 
the actual French colonials who went down there from France and weren't Algerians or Bedou or anything like that, who remained in the country. That's almost unheard of in colonialism for that to happen. And I think what that speaks to is a subtext, subtext of savagery that the French had imposed on them since the colony became you know, a, a French possession in the 1830s. You know, so I, I think as, as a snapshot, France is real interesting to look at as what can happen to a country with torture. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, it, it makes me think. Also, uh, I heard some other people argue, you know, for in support of government, in you know, from this very reason, like that, you know, that you say troops go over and they torture people, and they say, look, you see, people are savages, people are evil. This is why we need government to rein in the savagery of people. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm thinking, what? Are you serious? Like, they, all this is done under the cloak of government, right? Under the banner of, of the state. <laughs> How can you say, and, you know? And, and, <laughs> you're right, Danilo, it's a brilliant point. Because what I found, though, is that now I do Socratic drilling with people. In my younger days, I used to be rather savage where somebody say, I'm a communist or I'm a socialist. I'd go, like, oh, you're this, blah, 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 blah. I'd be very accusatory and I'd be very, well, I'm not a very rude guy. I'm pretty gentle. But I, I guess I'd be rude for who I am at the time. And I, and, and I could see that it, it was having a negative effect on me. Now, if I meet DeMille and you don't happen to be the abolitionist who I know you'd be, but you happen to be a socialist just for role playing purposes, DeMille, you'd say, I'm a socialist. And I'd say, tell me about that. And the reason I say that is because I want you through Socratic questioning, to explain to me what socialism means. Because what really gets most socialists, communists, or, and neoconservatives, for that matter, is at the end, I'll listen to, the, to what they talk about, and I'll say, you know, the only reason why I can't subscribe to your philosophy, despite the way you've painted it, and how colorful you've made it, and how beneficial for all of us it appears to be, is that I think that the use of violence to form a society means that you're using immoral means to achieve moral ends, and that's an impossible question, e equation, so I can never be on board with that. And most of them are speechless when I say that. Yeah, yeah. And then from there, you can Socratically drill. And you can say, for instance, what I love about being an abolitionist, to know, we've talked about this before, I think, is that people say, well, what's that? It means I'm opposed to all forms of human slavery. Which ones do you support? Mm -hmm. So it's another meaning so, of... Uh, of making people sort of have to come out and morally justify their wickedness. And it puts them in an uncomfortable position with talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of my uh, family members, it's funny you use the example socialist because a lot of my family members are Democrats slash socialists. They, they enjoy to call themselves that. And, and uh, just recently, uh, we were talking about Cuba and, and they were saying how wonderful of a country it is. Like, uh, you know, it's got great culture. It's got, you know, all this stuff. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm like, how many people do you hear fleeing um, you, the United States to go into Cuba? Or how many people do you know fleeing South Korea to go into North Korea? <laughs> if it's such a wonderful place, right? <laughs> I know, I know. Because often, of course, it's the opposite, <laughs> right? Now, I have to tell you, I grew up in Miami and I love Cuban culture. I love the music, I love the food, I love the dancing. I, I think it's well, I can't wait to go to Cuba. I can't wait. Think of this too, Danilo. This is exciting. I'm not a bass fisherman, but I have friends who are bass fishermen. Americans are the best bass fishermen on planet Earth. In the 1950s, under the regime before Castro, they have a lot of lakes on Cuba, and the mafia would stock several of those lakes with really prized bass. Hmm. The Cubans aren't competent bass fishermen like Americans, so imagine what kind of bass are waiting in Cuban lakes for talented American bass fishermen. Really? Oh, yeah. Among other things. <laughs> and of course, the joys of cooking, the joys of eating Cuban food. Yeah, yeah. Cuban music, you know, I'd have to have my ears soldered shut if I could only listen to Mexican music, but I love Afro-Cuban. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, was, uh, I was hearing yeah. about the, uh, the um, you know, very old-style Cuban cars, and, and everyone's saying, oh, look at that, that's so quaint, and that's so, that's so nice, look at how cute their cars <laughs> are. But it, it's, it's, it's as a result of the, you know, the, the, the fascistic arm of the government stifling Cuban innovation and <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's not, exactly. It's not that they're trying to be cute or yeah. quaint, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I, I, it's going to be great when it opens up. I think I think sanctions on Cuba is what has kept Castro in power. I think if, if one were to take an academic gander at sanctions as a useful international arm of influence in a nation state's behavior, they would find it usually achieves the exact opposite. Mm. Castro has been able to use those sanctions as the North Koreans have, and I would suggest as the Iranians have, as a rallying cry mm. for being oppressed from external mechanisms and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Yeah, yeah. Who is? I mean, I mean, what authority do the do the political elite have on restricting the free trade between people? You know that that just want to trade. Regard like, what does it matter if you know a car is made in Germany or you know a sweater is made in you know Iran? Like, if people want to buy it, they want to purchase it. That's their business, right? <laughs> it's, it's no. It, it it should be no. Um, how do you say? There is there is no reason that you know any kind of political master should get involved in that at all i mean they shouldn't exist at all but but it's it's, it's just it's just stifling basic trade like <laughs> and i and i guess in one sense it pits one country against another country so it it encourages nationalism in some sense like that right so yeah i, yeah. I can see yeah. that happening but i um, agree Th thank goodness though we don't have a one world government because things could be far worse than it is so far you know what i love about international relations is that when people say anarchy doesn't work, and I say, take a look at international relations. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That's anarchy in action. Yeah. You know, and, and by the way, when you go home this evening, and you're having dinner with your family, and you've invited friends later to have a pool party or something, that's anarchy in action. When you go to Trader Joe's, and you're shopping for your family, that's anarchy in action. <laughs> by the way, when, 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 um, when you open a door for a lady, you're not doing that because you're afraid of a jail sentence. You're doing it because you're a gentleman. Right. Right. That's anarchy in action. Right. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's you know the discussion. The discussion you and I are having. We're not having this discussion because we're afraid. We're having this discussion because we owe this to our children and our grandchildren to make sure we plant the seeds. Yeah. Right. Because the things won't yeah. change unless the uh, the status quo is challenged. Actually, it reminds me of a great quote. It's like we we, we revere the um, the live live conformists and the dead troublemakers. <laughs> right <laughs> isn't, isn't that isn't that sad you know people like edward snowden who are trying to tell the people you know something that will help them realize the abuses and rampant crimes of those in power yeah. is vilified and he's yeah. forced to flee right whereas you know uh you know the guy with the, the guy chris kyle with, that made you know the subject of america's sniper <laughs> he's killed all these people in cold blood people he's never met never knew just because he's following an order and he's a hero right <laughs> i mean what kind of a sick society I don't is get it, that but I, I gotta tell you i did i didn't watch american sniper for six months because i uh, i thought it would be a raw raw mm -hmm. flick but here's i think clint eastwood if he was never an actor, and I love his acting, yeah. if he was never an actor, he would have been one of the best American directors ever to set foot on a set. There's no doubt in my mind. He does top-notch cinematic work. I mean, just terrific. But when I watched it, and of course we're talking about confirmation bias here, and maybe it was my bias, isn't it? Yeah. My filters were on for being anti-war. I thought to myself, there's, a, there's an anti-war undercurrent in this whole thing, because Chris Kyle wasn't exactly an enviable human being towards the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. You can see the toll it had taken on him because he has to live with those faces every night. Or, or maybe even that he has daytime vision to do no longer. But, because unfortunately he was he was gunned down by something Because yeah. yeah. I would never I would never I don't wish violence upon people unless I'm acting in self defense because murder begins where self defense ends. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't wish to, to uh to kill Kyle, but for Kyle to be lionized by so much of the population for invading a country and then shooting not only men, but apparently from the film and from what we've seen of his own explanation of what he's done, he has shot women and children. So am I to suppose, let's look at that, am I to suppose that the Chinese, North Koreans, you name the bad guy, invade the United States? Would you then lionize the Chinese snipers who were taking out American resistors? Oh, maybe not, would you? <laughs> yeah, Got it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People yeah. people 
just defending their home country from invaders is what it is. You know, we are the terrorists, right? That's exactly what they're doing. It reminds That's me. It reminds me of the. Is, no, no, I was gonna say it reminds me of terrorism the. Terrorism comes from occupation. Right, right, right. Like um, this comedian, yeah. he he said he said not only will we invade your country, not only will we destroy your houses and assault your women and children and kill them. Years later, we will make a movie about it and then cry and be sad about it that we did that. <laughs> <laughs> like what <laughs> so it's almost like collectivism is a mental illness yeah it is oh yeah I definitely believe that oh yeah, yeah. the most dangerous what were you going to say about Eastwood oh yeah I was going to say uh, Clint Eastwood I think he, you think he's a libertarian in some I don't know if he's full fledged but in some, in some sense I think yeah. he was kind of a libertarian and the purpose of the film I, I, I heard from many sources was to portray the horrors and atrocities of war and he and and, it's, and it's, although I didn't see the movie, but um, but from what I gather, that was the purpose of his movie. However, um, it in many people in in a lot of Americans who were already gung ho, you know, status types, they their patriotism was even more strengthened as a result. Even though that's that's what it was intention was, you know. So it it in some sense it seemed to have the opposite effect. And again, that's confirmation bias. Yeah. Right. Yeah, when the, when the end credits are rolling in American Sniper, it shows the miles-long line of people waving flags when his funeral procession is passing down the Texas highway. Oh, really? So it sort of, yeah, so it sort of grandstands that very thing you were just describing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> and yeah, talking about torture, like, you know, when when is torture mostly done is in times of war, right? <laughs> because war is glorified murder, right? I think my, one of my favorite Voltaire quotes is, um, yes. is uh, murder is um, murder is illegal or, un- or unacceptable except when it's done in large numbers and, and to the sound of trumpets, <laughs> right? <laughs> because when the, state, right. when the state does it, it's not murder, right? It's war. There's, you know, these, these, these tremendous political euphemisms, you know, that, that we all learn really well. Taxation is not theft, right? Because it's your civic duty, <laughs> right? That's right. Voting's not violence because when you pull that lever, you're not um, implying any consent upon your neighbors. Got it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and just yeah. re- reversing all of that indoctrination, expelling all that statist excrement that has that has built up over the years, <laughs> <laughs> is not easy, you know, because it, it gets lodged in it's there in, in the nooks and crannies of your of your intellect, <laughs> and you know, to expel that requires a lot of self reflection, self examination, reevaluation of basic core principles that you know are drilled deep yeah. inside and. Uh, and so that, yeah. that's one reason why a lot of people get very angry when you, when you try to challenge their sacred cows, right? Exactly, because sacred cows make the best burgers. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? It's, uh, you, know, the, is it, you know, I was just discussing this with a friend today, Danilo, and I'll bet you're just like this. I find that when I have these discussions and somebody calls me out and maybe I discover that I'm wrong, I'm not offended by that, but I find when I have these discussions with collectivists, they tend to anger, or they tend to shut up, or they tend to clam up, or they tend to dismiss you out of hand. For me, this is sort of like an it's it's an intellectual adventure where I'm always learning new stuff. You know, like this show with you, I've learned a couple of things I didn't know as a result of having the conversation with you, and I'm always going to be in a learning mode because I'm a lifelong learner. I find a lot of collectivists, not so much. Right. Part of that is television because the glass teat, you know, why do you think they call it programming? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's all, that should be everything you need to know. Yeah. Don't watch TV. You know, if there's any, if, you're, if your audience from this broadcast today takes anything from this, this uh, podcast you and I are doing, turn off your TV. If anything, only stream because stream, streaming is a very deliberate thing to do program by program. Mm. If you have broad if you have satellite or cable, you should get it out of your house. Especially if you have children. Mm. If you have video games in your house, get them out. They should be in the front yard mm. waiting for the next trash pickup. <laughs> 
Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. TV um, it has been hijacked. Um, news. It, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean. It's basically you know the basic news stations are basically government news stations. You know, you know we got to be yes, re- realistic. Exactly we got to be yeah. realistic about that. They're basically yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the the cheerleaders. You know, the lapdogs of of the ruling class, <laughs> basically. And I call NPR National Parrot Radio. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. My, of course, my family loves that. <laughs> but um, um, and, and one of the overarching messages of of news is you know people are cruel, heartless, right? Um, evil, violent men. All men are rapists, right? Fear your neighbor. Fear, fear. There other ought religion. to be a law. There ought to be a there law. Ought be a law. <laughs> there ought to be a law. Keep, no, keep talking. Keep talking. I'm just, this is just the background. <laughs> keep talking. Fear, there ought to be a law. Fear, there ought to be a law. Fear the there other country. Law. Fear all there countries. <laughs> I mean, there ought to be a law. And there then the, you know the federal <laughs> the Federal Reserve stabilizes the currency. The Federal Reserve protects the you know all this kind of oh I can just go on and on. <laughs> you know, trust the experts. Know. Trust it's nonsense. We we just need to get the right person in office, right? <laughs> That's and, right. And it's like yeah. it's like you don't even have to do anything because we have the politicians, the, the experts. They're there. Why, why do we have to do anything? The violence broke. That's right. Yeah. You know, if we want, you need a wood shampoo. You're thinking. Yeah. If if we want something, they're just gonna steal it for us. So why even bother? You know. <laughs> Actually, I saw a great meme. It said, um, Sorry. it said voting is. <clears throat> you you see a guy taking money out of the wallet, uh, out of somebody else's wallet, and then and the guy puts something in the ballot box, and he's like, all of the violence and none of the responsibility, or none of the guilt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. One of my. One of my favorite voting memes of late is the guy's uh, by a young sapling, and he's got a noose around his neck. It's connected to a branch, right. and he's watering the tree. I see that. Yeah, that's a great yeah. one too. Yeah. So yeah. exactly, and and actually, I'm reading a book right now. I don't know if you're familiar, Frank Karsten, Beyond Democracy. Uh, it's a pretty great book. You no, know um, but I'll check it out. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent book. And um, and and one thing he was saying is every single democracy devolves into you know fascism, you know totalitarianism. Because the voters constantly are constantly wanting to, you know, take from the government largesse, from you know, from steal from from your neighbor, right? Nobody has the incentive to actually produce because you constantly everybody's clamoring for the free loot, right? It's because all, yeah, yeah, all democracy makes your neighbor your property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell people it's like yeah. it's like, it's like we're all, look at and look at Greece. Yeah, right, <laughs> Greece. Oh man. <laughs> Oh my. They have a referendum. They say no, and then and the Greek government says yes, <laughs> yes. Don't don't listen yes. to them. Don't listen to them. <laughs> no, no. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh man, yeah, isn't it amazing? You know, Greece is the, you know, that's where that's where the great, um, you know, philosophical greats originated. Yet today they're just mired in debt and socialism and waste and rot and oh, you know it's horrible. <laughs> A, a beautiful country, though. I've been to Crete. It's just beautiful there, and I'd love to go again. But twenty-five percent of their economy is based in tourism, and, and I don't think I don't think their tourism numbers are going to increase with this with this latest unrest they've had. Right, 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 right. And uh, so, I, I mean, a lot of people that I talk yeah. to from from Europe, you know, one of the one of their, uh, of course, the less economically literate of them, <laughs> you know, the one they're saying, you know, we have free healthcare, we have free <laughs> co- colleges and universities. It's just a wonderful place. And and what is it? They have high high minimum wage, I assume. You know, all like all the basic socialist crap um, that you hear, uh, but you don't you don't see the. Uh, the violence underneath, you know, the implicit violence that uh, that is involved in, like, what, taking sixty what sixty percent of your income, something like that. Yeah, so. and, and you, 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 and I both know that. To know, we know that both intellectually and instinctually, that theft is wrong, that robbery is wrong, that murder is wrong, that initiated aggression is wrong. But all the rest of the body snatched people that were surrounded by. They think otherwise. They think that collectivism is good, and they think that that impossible moral calculus of immoral means can yield moral ends. Yeah. They think, well, yeah, I wouldn't put a slash through that sign. They like it that way. Oh yeah, it's, it's hard to uh, wean yeah. yourself off of free stuff, right? When it's not <laughs> when, indeed when you're not the one yeah. that's producing it. <laughs> That's right. So, That's so, right. so before I let you go, can you can you just give us a um, yeah. you know your opinions on Donald Trump and the whole fiasco of uh, <laughs> of him trying sure, to trying to yeah. lead lead America to freedom? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm a proud non-voter because I, I think that uh, 
I think voting is violence, as as you and I have discussed, and I think you've discussed on your program before, even when I haven't been with you, and that I refuse to do it because of that. What Donald Trump does that I think is valuable is the same thing that Bernie Sanders does, the, uh, the self-avowed socialist from Vermont. Yeah. They broaden the framework of the argument. It's what Ron Paul brought to the process that hadn't been there for decades, in 2008 and 2012, mm -hmm. when uh, Ron Paul's the only guy there who's saying, well, uh, why should we go overseas? Why can't there be peace on Earth? Why do we conduct infanticide you know, across the fetid plane? Why do we do all these things? Maybe Trump, for all his fascisty leanings that he has, will ask some of those questions. I don't know if he will or not. Maybe Bernie Sanders will do the same thing. You know, there was this curious thing that happened with Dennis Kucinich. Do you remember him, the Democrat? Okay. Who Ron Paul was talking about, well, I think it was 2008 or 2012. Maybe he'd be a running mate or something. He's a Democrat. He's very socialistic, very much the collectivist. But he wants foreign policy abroad to be much more peaceable than it is now, much less warlike than it is now. Mm -hmm. The cognitive indifference that Kucinich doesn't understand in his own twisted head, though, is that that sponge that looks like a brain isn't computing because mm -hmm. if you want peace overseas, why don't you want peace at home? Mm -hmm. If you don't want to use violence overseas, why do you want to use it at home? Because Ron Paul has been the only candidate. you got to talk about Ron Paul even though you brought up Trump. Yeah. Ron Paul has been the only candidate who truly wants peace on earth. And he means it. Mm -hmm. He never tailored a speech to an audience because he spoke from his heart, he spoke from his, his spirit, and he spoke from what he knew. So Donald Trump, he's a clown. Bernie Sanders, he's a clown. And everybody in between, they're all clowns. For me, the ultimate ticket for 2016 is Clinton, Sanders, or Sanders, Clinton. And if Cthulhu could be on there as a vice president to the vice president, I'd go for that too because at least to give moral balance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and also there's a there's, there are a few anarchists. I'm, I'm sure you've heard that, uh, like Jeff Berwick and um, a couple of people, uh, and also Daryl Perry um, and uh, what's, uh, Adam Kokesh, I think in 2020, who are going to be running for president on the peaceful dissolution of the state, which is a noble um, and a praiseworthy goal. Uh, I wish them all the best. Um, but that still yes, that still doesn't do encourage me to want to get involved in the political process. Um, but uh, you know, if they think they can change the Leviathan from within, <laughs> it's like it's like you know, I hear that all the time. That, you know, you, you, you know, you see the Lord of the Rings, you know, the Eye of Sauron. You think you can, you know, if you want you you want to change, you know, the Eye of Sauron, join Sauron's army and change it from within. <laughs> you want to change you want to change you want to change hell, go to hell and change it from within. <laughs> you know, it's like so but if, but if they think they can do it, all 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 the best for them. That's hilarious. <laughs> you know, um, you know and and Danilo, the thing I recommend you do on the day that the vote comes is I want you to get books called Whatever Happened to Penny Candy and I want you to sit down with your children, open the book when the, when the ballots open and start reading to your children. Whatever happened to Penny Candy? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it talks about inflation. Oh, okay. It explains economics to your children. Ah, so. I see. Ah, yeah. I see. Right, right, right. Penny Candy. Yeah. Okay, okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, um, so I'm Bill Bubert, zerogov.com. I have a book called Zero Gov: Limited Government, Unicorns, and Other Mythical Creatures on Amazon at a cheap price of two dollars and ninety nine cents. And I would urge everybody to buy it, of course. I'm coming out with a revised and expanded edition of it in which I will double or even triple its size once it gets back from the editor because I've got approximately 300, 350 pages to add to it. What is already about, I think, 300 pages. So, wow. And I won't raise the price. See that? A true... Uh a true humanitarian at heart. Eh? <laughs> Excellent. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Bill, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Great conversation. Hey, it's always an honor to be on, Demillo. I hope to uh, talk to you again in the future. Yeah, definitely. We'll uh, talk again about some of your other some of your other writings. You're, all, you're always coming out with something new. So beautiful. So uh, thank you everyone Thanks. for listening. If anyone wants to donate, help out the show. Um, I accept pay PayPal or Bitcoin. And very soon I'm going to be accepting Patreon. I'm uh, currently getting that set up, but uh, it's going to facilitate some donations. Everybody wants to help us out. If you want to uh, send some gold and silver through the mail, I don't trust USPS, but if you think you can get it, by all means, try. 
<laughs> we wouldn't we wouldn't want those things to get lost like 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 most other you know pieces <laughs> gets lost um <laughs> so uh very cool thank you very much for a wonderful conversation uh this is peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and the conscious resistance.com and the seeds of liberty.com wishing everyone have a wonderful day take care bye